It's Tubal Kane again, and this is day four of this dynamo build. If you haven't watched the other three parts, be sure and go back and do them. And today is the day when I'm going to start winding the armature here for this little dynamo. And I have here at the closing lathe uh, a coil of uh, magnet wire, and I've got a magnetic, uh, magnetic indicator holder right here just to allow the the coil to spin as I wind the armature. To start with I've got just a little piece of shrink tubing on there and you'll see why later on. And that's just free to drop out of the way. And I'll take the end of the wire and put it through this hole and allow oh three or four inches there that can be cut off later on. And I'll start by winding this side of the spool and I'm going to run the lathe slow speed in reverse and I'm just going to totally fill up this uh, side of the spool and it's not real easy to wind it uh, evenly as you might think and sometimes it's easy to do the first few layers but then it just get, starts uh, going its own way and I guess it doesn't matter so I'll just fill up this side and then I'll work my way over to the other side and fill up that side as well and both sides need to be wound in the same direction. Now there are formulas for this I suppose as to what size magnet wire you need to use and how many turns, how many wraps and so on but all of this is just being done by Bagasse and Bagash. And here I go and I'm trying to keep and even uh, pressure on it at all times between my uh, fingers. I'm going back in the other direction. You can see to start with it's fa fairly even. But then the wire has a mind of its own right about now. Alright, this side of the spool is wound. Perhaps I should have called it a bobbin. And there's the original wire there, and I moved that off to the side. And that little piece of shrink tube that I talked about before just serves to insulate it across when I, when I make my, uh, my cross over here. Whether or not that's necessary, I do not know. But I am just a man that wears both suspenders and a belt, so I'm using it. And then again, going the same direction, I'm freewheeling it now for a minute to get it started. And now I'm ready to do it under power. Here we go. Okay, there it is. I'm going to take a piece of tape. This side isn't going to unwrap on me, but this side will. So I'm just going to tape that, temporarily at least, so it doesn't go any place on me. And I'll cut it off right about here. You know what? I didn't have a whole lot of wire left. And I don't know where you can buy the wire. I guess over YouTube, but or not YouTube, uh, eBay. 
but uh, this came from an auction but you might also find it at Radio Shack but I think they sell real small useless quantities of it. I have now moved the work in a little closer to the chuck and I am proceeding to cut it off to length. And I won't show all of that. There's the freshly wound coil hot off the press. Still got a little nipple on there. And uh, as far as the length is concerned, remember I wanted it to be one and a half, so I'm just a little over. Ten thousandths over one and a half. And uh, of course it doesn't quite fit into the stator because there's no curvature, no radius on here yet. So I'm going to show you how to do that in uh, just a minute here. But uh, I've stripped the varnish off on the end here, so let's make a test to see if it has turned into a magnet. Got a couple double D ray of X. Watch that little bar there. And it works. This is how I go about putting the radius on the end of the armature. I've got it uh, temporarily mounted on a 3 16 bolt and I'm just swiveling it or pivoting it on that up against the belt in a manner similar if not identical to this. Here's my little grandson Henry. He's 15 months old and walking. The last time you saw him was in my Kennedy toolbox. Hi Henry. He likes it down in here around the machinery, don't you buddy? Gotta get him used to this machine shop. I now have the radius on the end of the armature and it fits rather nicely into the stator and the next thing I need to do is to fasten permanently the main shaft into the uh, armature hole. I've already calculated that I want it uh, at about that little black mark and I just did that because I'm using now my living drawing and it's a little bit off center so I have room for the commutator. So I'm going to just use some Loctite, but of course there's other ways of holding it. It could be knurled or it could be a press fit. And I recall when I worked at a place that made uh, Electropal fishing motors in the 60s that uh, they made their own armatures there. And I made the shafts, stainless steel shafts, and they were knurled. But quite a long straight knurl and the laminations were pressed on the knurl. But in this case, I'm just going to Loctite it right up to that line, let it set for a while, and then it's ready to start uh, assembling, and there's some other little parts to make, make uh, primarily the commutator, and then the bearings. Remember Loctite is an anaerobic, and it has set, or hardened, or cured, or whatever it is that it does, and so that is done. Now note also that I wrapped the excess wire, one on each side, into a little coil and I didn't invent that. I saw somebody else that had done that. I thought that was pretty neat. Just a way of storing that extra wire because you hate to cut it off too short and then what do you got? And I have stripped the end that is uh, scraped the varnish off of this so that I can tin that with solder here in a little while. And uh, the next step then is to start working on either the bearings or the commutators. But let me talk a little bit about uh, the commutator first. And on the first model here, I made a relatively small diameter commutator. And I just think that uh, as far as working on it, the ease of working on it, I like a little bit bigger one. So that's what I did on this one. So that's what my commutator will look like, possibly a little shorter than this, because I don't intend to make the brushes quite that wide. That was just a, a mock-up. 
So what I'm going to do here is I take some um, of this vacuum hose. You know, cars don't have vacuum systems on them anymore like they did. Well, we're going to get the vacuum without a manifold. So uh, I bought three rolls of this in different sizes. Guess where I got it. But this happens to be quarter inch, blah, blah, blah. You can read it. And I cut off just a short piece, perhaps three quarters of an inch. And that happens to be three sixteenths more or less on the inside so I intend to uh, slide that over I'll do that off camera because it's kind of a struggle to get it on there it's such a good fit and then I've got some of this brass tubing here and this happens to be what is it 7 16 OD so the ID just happens to fit this. How convenient, as church lady would say. Remember her? And then I'll cut the brass to length, slit it on both sides so that I have two commutator pieces. It is my intention to cut this brass tubing off on the black line, but before I do, as I just mentioned, I want to slit it. What I'd like those two lines to be exactly 180 degrees apart so here's how I'm going to do it but bagasse and bagasse would probably be good enough the diameter of the tubing is uh, well I shouldn't say the diameter the height of the tubing using the height gauge from the surface plate right here to the top is uh, 1.350 and I'm deducting half of the uh, diameter which is the radius which is 0.219 and uh, the dimension is 1.131. I've set the height gauge as such. And I'm just going to scribe it like that on both sides fairly deep if I can. Then using uh, your selection of O-rings and uh, I'm going to use this size here which is there you can see I'm about out of them and that is what I'm going to use as a keeper you can see one here on each end holding the uh, the brass onto the rubber. There's probably other ways of doing that. I don't know where I got the idea, but uh, naturally it has to be insulated from the shaft, from the rest of the machine. So that's why it's uh, on rubber. Now on this one, if you don't have any of that vacuum tube, this is a different diameter, but the tubing that's underneath this little commutator is some of that vinyl, clear vinyl tubing like you can get at any hardware store. I'm going to tin this before I cut it off because it's so terribly hard to handle once you've cut it to length. So with my little pencil type um, soldering iron here, A singular drop on each side. Now why a singular drop? Because otherwise it might be in the way of the brush and um, for those of you that are more observant than others, well I probably didn't show up in the, I, I got a bit of a glare here, but uh, naturally the brass had to be cleaned before you could, I soldered, so I scraped away just a tiny little area near the end, that way the solder doesn't spread and uh, the corrosion if you will uh, helped me for once and now I will rotate it 180 degrees and uh, do the same thing on the other side. Similarly, I had a teacher that always said similarly and I like that word. I will also tin the ends of these. And it really makes a difference if you, if you have pre-tinned it. All 
Of course, my critics will be saying, doesn't he ever clean the tip of his soldering iron? And yes, I cleaned it moments before I used it with a file and then uh, used a flux on it. Uh, but it very quickly turns black, uh, unfortunately. But and the other question is, what to do with a hot iron? You know, I got burns all over my bench, burns all over my hands from uh, years past. So now I generally put it on the floor to cool or over on the drill press table. Now using either a Dremel cut off or in this case it's my Fordham and I took uh, a fine red although the color is irrelevant Sharpie. Sharpies are handy in the shop aren't they? And with an abrasive cut off wheel I'm gonna slit it. Notice I still haven't cut it off of the main piece yet and uh, it you need something to hang on to. I know I emphasize that over and over. There we go. Like so. The brass tubing is most difficult to cut off without distorting it, even with an extremely fine model maker's type of, of blade. So I'm going to cut it off also with the Fordham tool. And by the way, the For Fordham is one fine product. Reminds me too much of going to the dentist, which I did six days ago, and it cost me $900 for a crown on which he worked on me 15 minutes one time and 15 the next time and well I know I got plenty of dentists that watch me too because uh, dentists have to be very good with their hands and, and mine is and he's paid well for it and I guess he deserves it he went to school for 10 years all right I'll cut this off off camera I took the liberty of deburring with a little uh, Swiss jeweler's file. There wasn't much of a burr though, there never is with a cutoff wheel like that. And if you don't have cutoff wheels, be sure and buy some of those. A uh, Dremel brand is what I use. Now this is a two-pole motor, therefore there is two sections to the commutator. Remember a commutator is just a switch. If it's a four-pole motor, you're going to have uh, more sections. but we need to time this. That is, this section will have to be in this position, not cocked one way or the other, and certainly not sideways like this. And if you remember back to that St. Louis motor, I told you that you could play with the timing on, the, on those brushes. But I'll put one on like that, and the one on the bottom, and I'm going to struggle with that off camera with these little O-rings and I'll just put one on to keep it on while I do the soldering. Now do you see why I pre-soldered it and uh, did this in the exact steps that I did because it's most awkward and they're, they're small and hard to work and look at how fat my hands are. I may have talked about this the other day but I'm back to the St. Louis motor here and uh, I wanted to rehash this business about timing the uh, commutator. Notice how slow the St. Louis motor is running at the moment, but now when I turn the commutator, or actually I'm turning the brushes, not the commutator, but that's changing the timing. Now it's in the correct timing. And you hear how fast it's running? I'm, I can't, I don't know if you're able to perceive that or not. Might have covered this, but this is four days later. So watch what I'm doing here now. If I close. I hope there's young boys watching this who have an interest in electricity. I know there's girls and women that watch my videos.
All right, enough on that. And I cannot give you the electrical theory. I do not have the background, but there'll be engineers watching this who will take great pleasure in correcting me, I am sure. Notice how worn my case pocket knife is from me carrying it probably 40 years. And you know, this is still a good old carbon steel one. As far as I know, you can no longer buy a case pocket knife with carbon steel blades. It's all bogus stainless steel and they're all collectible type for $50 or more. I want a $9 case pocket knife made of carbon steel that will hold its edge that I can carry every day and not keep in a case. Oh man, how I get sidetracked. But I like to entertain myself. Now notice I have the uh, commutator in place held with a singular O-ring and I'm ready to solder and I should not need to add any solder and that's why I have in fact pre-tinned everything I'm not as steady as I used to be maybe I never was steady And now the other side. And I really have too much wire there in that little coil, but that's the way it's going to stay. I'm always afraid to cut things off too short. Remember now that the commutator has to be insulated from the shaft. So notice that I have a little of a bit of a space here. It is not touching up against the uh, other part of the rotor. Wire is just a little looser there than I, I like. Matter of fact, perhaps it's too loose. Latrec. Equal space here on the commutator on each side and we used to call that undercutting the mica when we uh, redid generators and starters you old timers know what I'm talking about now everything throw away alright enough blabbering that completes the armature the rotor it is done and now I must turn my attention to the bearings The armature rotor is now done, as is the stator. Stator. I should say stator. We don't say stationary, we say stationary. Bad habit. So I'm ready to erect the engine and I need to start the bearings. And these are the bearings. And originally this came off of another engine. They're stock castings. That's a bad end on that one, but I used to cut them off right on those grooves there, but I will cut it off on this groove and throw away the, the hidden portion so that I have enough height. But that's quite enough for this part of the video. That will be continued in the next part. Be sure and watch all of the other parts. And this is Tubal Cain saying so long for today, and I'll see you in the next part of this video.